Today I'm going to be talking about a subject that's uh, very dear to me and I think is very dear to uh, the kingdom of God. And it's one, it's, a, it's an immovable uh, law that God has set up in the universe. And I'm going to call this message today, Cause and Effect. Christianity is a practical religion. Christianity is the, is the thinking man's religion. If you've got a brain, don't check your brain in at the door. Because God wants you to think on your feet, sitting down, standing. He wants you to think using your Christian roots, using our uh, Christian uh, background and history to advance yourself, not only in the kingdom, but for yourself in life. So it's a practical religion. It tames our society. Christianity tames society. Where you see Christianity, you see less bloodshed. It tames our society. It gives our society a future. So there's a cause and effect for having Christian ethics in the world. When Christianity is really being practiced, the courts aren't clogged with murders, with, with robberies, with all kinds of other things going on. Society changes. It tames itself. Christianity tames us and tames society, and it extends the life of its citizens. On the other hand, the lack of it produces mayhem and chaos. Um, I can, uh, I've had uh, meetings where we've invited in speakers over the last, I've run a lot of organizations here locally in, in central Wisconsin and, and had the uh, honor uh, to be chosen to run things, and I've brought in people that were not Christian. They were leaders in their, in their area of expertise, but they weren't Christians, and sometimes they were so far away from Christianity, although well-educated, and they could talk for 20 minutes, if that's the kind of time I gave them to give a speech, and they could talk for 20 minutes and not say one thing. You couldn't stand up and go, I got something out of that. It's because there's people will loop conversations, and the same thing goes with anything that's non-Christian. There's no real meat or substance to what people have to say without having a Christian undertone or a moral undertone. And the reason is, is because God set up some immutable laws and those laws cannot be violated because they're just ongoing. Whether you're a Christian or not, it makes no difference. So these laws are absolutes. They are absolutes about our present judgments and our future judgments, those that are becoming in the future. Not only in this life, but in the life to come. God has a reward system for good and bad behavior. There is a cause and effect of everything. And so we're going to be looking at in depth here this morning. Start with me uh, this morning over in Proverbs chapter 10. Proverbs 10. Proverbs chapter 10. When I was a businessman here, I started many companies, but this, my one company that was very successful, on the back of my business card, when business cards were the popular thing to hand out, I put 10 scriptures for the businessman on back. And this was one of those scriptures that I had in there that I would hand out to people that thought that they had to separate their business from their religion because they had in their head somehow if they were successful, they were in sin and then they would go to church and repent, but they needed to be successful for their employees and, and for their shareholders and for their partners. And so there was a, there was a void, in be, the, there was no connection between being a good Christian and being good in business or being good working for your boss. And so there has always been... There has always been a group of, of Christians out there that want to demonize you doing well in life or demonize you doing well in business. And make no mistake about it, business, life, family, God, country, they're all related to one another. And God wants us to do well in all those areas without ignoring other areas. He wants us to do uniformly well and increase uniformly. Amen. Amen. Proverbs chapter 10, starting in verse 4. Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, 
but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Now, I want you to look at verse 4 very carefully. Poor is he. It's not instantaneous, but if you, are, if you have a negligent hand, if you're lazy, if you don't set your mind and your jaw to do certain things in life, you will eventually become impoverished. And then it goes on to say in verse 5, He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. So we have a harvest coming, right? So first of all, we have to prepare. So he who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely. So as the crops are coming into maturity, you go out there and you start harvesting the crops while there's that window of opportunity. There's a window of opportunity in every business. Farmers know the window of opportunity well. It's called summertime. It's called harvest time. Most people don't know that there's windows of opportunity that open and they close. Reminds me of putting a bowl of fruit on my kitchen table. That bowl of fruit looks good. I got oranges in there. I got pears in there. I got lemons, limes. I got a few other things, apples in there. And eventually that bowl of fruit, because it doesn't agree with one another, whatever it is, it doesn't stay very long. And all of a sudden begins to get an odor and you have to toss it out. There is a window of enjoying that fruit. And that is like everything else in life. There are windows to take advantage of. The window might be your youth. The window might be your, your young age. The window might be your age and experience in your old life. But there are windows of opportunity that open and they close. And when they close, you have to wait for another opportunity for them to open up again. Again, let's start in verse 4. Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. And I, when I memorized this, I, I would recite it to myself over and over again. I memorized it in the King James. But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Hallelujah. And I would shout to myself and talk to myself in my car as I was driving around. And then, and then, I, would, then I would get geared up to make phone calls and go see people and, and to do the things that was required of me to do to make my company successful. He who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. Now that son could be referring to a parent, but we are all, what? Sons of God. Right. And uh, so if we are sons of God, God is looking at us as children. He's looking at us as sons. And we need to perform not shamefully before God with the giftings that God has given us. So there are in God's design of things, cause and effect. Everyone say cause and effect. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Science proves in this particular area, and in many other areas, but in this particular area, science proves that cause and effect actually is scientifically and mathematically able to be proven. You can prove cause and effect by science. In fact, one of the greatest scientists that actually came up with this was Sir Isaac Newton. He was born in 1642 died in 1726, so he lived to be about uh, 70, roughly 75, almost 85 years old. He was a physicist, a mathematician, a, an astronomer. He was actually also a, a theologian. He loved the Bible. And he came up with three laws of motion. And in a nutshell, this is what these three laws state. A body that is at rest tends to stay at rest, or a body that's in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. The second law is this, that a body reacts equal to the force applied to it. In other words, if you apply force to it, that body that, you, that you're putting your energy to, that body will react in equal value to the force applied to it. The third one is this, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So these are the three laws of cause and effect that were, that were put on paper by Sir Isaac Newton, but the world has always understood it. We've always understood it, even if we didn't have it worded quite that way. We've always known that if we do something, later on there will be an effect for what we do. Amen. And so if you do something now, you have to understand that it's going to come back to you Later on, no one can guarantee how their life is going to turn out. 
But I can tell you that we can raise the percentage of possibilities that we're going to be used by God and in the world system to a greater capacity if we understand the cause and effect of, of the majority of the scriptures that are available in the word of God. The majority of them have a cause and they have an effect. If you do this, then I'll reward you with this, this, and this. No one can guarantee how it'll turn out. But if you want to raise your percentages, if you want to give yourself a better chance of being successful, understand that cause and effect cannot be violated. You can't violate these laws. You might be able to get away with them for a period of time and fool yourself but you're only fooling yourself because these are immutable laws that cannot be changed. All right. So now here we have the laws of motion. Again, let's go back to verses four and five and see these laws of motion. All right. First of all, we see in verse four, we see the poor is he who works with a negligent hand. Inaction produces poverty. And what else does it produce? It produces shame because we can see it here. Right. He who gathers, verse five, he who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who acts shamefully. So what do we see? Inaction produces two things. It produces poverty and it produces shame. And what the world wants to see out of Christians is they are, they, the world is happy to see a Christian driving down the highway, blowing oil out of the tailpipe with 17 stickers on there, honk if you love Jesus. As long as you're not making money, because that's what they imagine the typical Christian to be. See, what they don't imagine the typical Christian to be is a successful Christian that's motivated, that's doing things well, that's the top performer in their company, the top performer in the earth, the top performer in their type, type of industry, the top worker on their job, the top contractor working amongst all the contractors. When they see you coming and there's a new project going in and they see you walking up, they know it's going to go well because you're the top performer. What they don't understand is you're also a very good Christian. And that's the way it's supposed to be. You should be a top performer in everything. And if you're not a top performer in everything, you're not doing what God has seeded inside of you or you're in the wrong industry. You need to find out where God wants you to be. Number one, once you find that, you plan on being the best that you can be at whatever you're doing. Can I hear an amen? amen. That's what God wants. Now, here's the second thing that we're seeing that's happening here. Action in verses four and five. Action, the hand of the diligent makes rich. Verse five, he who gathers in summer is a son who acts wisely. So what do we see? Action produces wealth and action produces wisdom. Action produces wealth and action produces wisdom. And what comes with wisdom and wealth? Honor always comes with wisdom and wealth. Those that don't love God will give you honor. You walk into a car dealership and you say, I am ready to plop down $50,000 cash on a car. Can you help me? And they will walk backwards as if you're a king in royalty. And they'll, walk, they'll roll out the red carpet for you and show you every car. They'll give you the red carpet treatment. Because you're someone that walks in with power. And they don't have to agree with your with your politics. They don't have to agree with your theology. They don't have to agree with your Christianity. Money talks. Money is always, always, always talks. And money is in itself power. And God wants you to have that kind of power. But that's not the only power that God wants you to have. So if God increases you, it's said of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that they increased in that year and God prospered them and the Philistines envied him. Referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in each one of them, those things happened three times. And so when God causes you to increase, your enemies around you not only become envious of you, but those that are not envious so much, but just curious, that will be a witness to them. They will see it as a witness. They will go, what is it that you have that I don't have? And I can tell you, I remember as God was increasing me and my business went, I was living in a one bedroom apartment. We had three kids on the other side of our, our sheet hanging in our little one bedroom apartment. And Kathy and I slept on the other side and God got us out of there, got us into a slightly bigger place and a slightly bigger place. 
All the same people I was calling on for 25, 30 years saw that increase until I started driving in cars that were greater than anything that they had ever owned or imagined owing. And what came to their thought is, Dave, what's happening to you? What are you doing differently than what I'm doing? I've been in the same job. I have owned the same company with no increase. What are you doing? I would flip my business card over. I said, read these scriptures, read them every day. And by the way, while, while you're reading them, would you like to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior? Led many businessmen to Christ. Many of them are still alive today. Right? Just because they saw cause and effect and they were curious enough, not jealous necessarily, but curious enough to go, what's happening in your life that's so different than what I see happening in other people's lives? Cause and effect. Those that criticize these types of things sometimes are those people, because they're inactive, they're convicted by it. Other people, they just grew up in a theology mindset that God is not supposed to prosper you, but come Monday morning, watch the same preacher or leader in a particular business lie, cheat, and steal in order to get ahead of his brother out there in the world. But come Sunday, he said, well, God doesn't want to prosper me. Really? Because on Monday morning, you broke about five laws and now come Sunday, seven days later, you're telling me that God doesn't want to prosper you. So why don't you quit lying, stealing, and cheating, get God on your side, and you won't have to do that every single Monday morning. Why don't you use God ways rather than man's ways or man-made religion, which is just, is just absolutely insane and inspired by the devil. Let's go over to Psalm 37, Psalm 37, verse 11. It says this, but the humble will inherit the land. Now, there is a cause and effect. If you are humble, you will go and inherit the land. How would you like to own more land than you own right now? Anyone here like to own more land than you, than you own right now? Some of you own too much land, you need to dump it, I understand. But for those of you who don't, amen. Owning more land is a blessing and it's a promise from God. But the humble will inherit the land. What does inherit mean? It doesn't mean that you're going to get it from your parents or your grandparents. It means that God is storing it up for you and waiting for you to get your heart right so he can just hand it over to you. What happened with the Israelites? The Israelites were told that I'm not going to move the peoples out of the way in the lands that I am giving you. I need you to march forward. I need you to cross the Jordan. I need you to keep going. In fact, God was upset with the Israelites when they didn't cross the Jordan and they were staying back on the other side. He said, how long will you put off taking possession of the land which I promise you? And my question to you today, church, is this. How long will you put off taking possession of the land that God has promised you? Well, I don't know the land, Pastor. I may, you know, I, my parents were always broke. Well, that's your mentality then. God doesn't want you to be broke, busted, and disgusted your entire life. It's a ridiculous way to live. No, I grew up poor. I know what it's like to be poor. And when we were adults, we got poor all over again. And then not too long ago, we got poor all over again. But I'll tell you what, the righteous man falls seven times and gets up again. But the wicked stumble in times of calamity. Completely. They're destroyed. And if you believe God, that God is going to take care of you, God will raise you back up again. Amen. So let's keep reading. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. I was sitting with a man not too long ago. He said, I don't want to come to your church anymore. You talk about prosperity all the time. I said, well, let's open up our Bibles. I said, what's this word right here? What's this word right here? And I went, prosper, prosperity, prosper, prosperity. But he already in, in his mind that I was evil and he was good because he wanted to be humble before God and, and be, be impoverished before God, when that doesn't give God any honor. Being impoverished before God does not give God any honor. Can I hear an amen? amen. You know, we talked about goals for the last three or four weeks. We ought to have some goals in there that are absolutely impossible for you to accomplish, but still are part of the calling on your life. So if you, I don't, you know, don't say that you want to become president when you've never been come, you've never called the politics in the first place. But if you know it's part of your calling, reach a little bit further than what you can see in the natural. 
because that's what God wants you reaching for. That's called faith. That's called having faith. That is the substance of things not seen. Amen? Now let's keep reading. We'll delight themselves in abundant prosperity. So what do I see here? We're not supposed to be shamed in having abundant prosperity. We're not supposed to be downtrodden by having a, oh my goodness, I just made another thousand dollars this week. Oh God, please forgive me. Oh, by the way, if you're really feeling guilty over everything that God has done for you and blessing you, come see me. We'll take the guilt off your back. Amen. 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 And then we'll send it on ahead of you and you can get it again and feel guilty all over in heaven. Look at this now. Verse 12, the wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth. Right? So the wicked man, the evil man, the cause and effect, he doesn't understand causes and effect. He gnashes his teeth at him. I was reminded of this morning, I was watching some things or some people get enrolled. You know what getting rolled means, right? They're in the city and they're getting rolled by a group of young thugs. And I was thinking about the scripture that says, do not go with them when they go to shed innocent blood. And I was thinking how modern day that scripture really applies because a bunch of people sitting around with a whole lot of time on their hands because they're not working, want to go out and roll somebody in order to, for a thrill or for money or whatever. They don't understand that that is going to come back to them. There is a cause and effect for everything that we do. Look at this now. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord, or Yahweh, laughs at him, for he sees his day is coming. In other words, there's a cause and effect, his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needy, to slay those who are upright in conduct. But they don't know, they don't realize that there's a cause and effect. Verse 15, their sword will enter their own heart and their bows will be broken. In other words, the pit that they dug, they'll fall into. The action that they started against you will come back against them. I can tell you, I have seen this up front and personal and close. And when it gets really, really close, it's upsetting to me because it's not something I wanted to see. But God has a cause and effect, and it's an immutable law that cannot be changed. You cannot violate these laws. Just because they look like they're doing okay now. This whole scripture, this whole section talks about this. This chapter does. About don't, don't, don't worry about those who are prospering in their way, but the wicked man prospering in the way. Judgment is coming. Give God a little time. Let's keep reading. Better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. That is actually interpreted differently. Better is the few of the righteous than the sound, the roar, and the murmur of many wicked. I've interpreted that many times in, in the original Hebrew. So let's not be afraid of the sound, the roar, and the murmur of many wicked. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. Everyone say, there's no fear here. No fear. Say, there's no fear here. There's no fear in your health. There's no fear with Omicron. There's no fear with all these other diseases. There's no fear here. Whatever happened, Kathy, to people actually just getting sick regularly, normally? I haven't heard of it now in two and a half years. Has anyone even gotten the common cold? Has anyone even gotten the flu? Did we, did we give up on those diseases? My goodness. Most of us live through them. I mean, 99.999% of us live through them. All right? Hallelujah. Amen. And if we're Christian, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. And every tongue that accuses us in judgment, we shall condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And my vindication, your vindication is from me, saith the Lord of hosts. Say Yahweh of hosts. Amen. So there is cause and effect for everything. Doing something now or not doing something now will affect your future. Let me give you an example. Since God has made us and he's made the universe and he set up all these laws, he has a right to hold, hold us to a set of moral standards and moral codes and, and moral absolutes. So when I say morality, I don't just mean sexuality, but there's a lot of moral absolutes that God will hold us to. You can't be a drunk all the time. You can't be asleep all the time. You can't not work all the time. That's a moral absolute that God holds us to. 
So what we decide not to do now, some things, we love some things. So we, some, some people just, they just, they just love uh, sleeping or they just love drinking or they just love uh, resting. Some people just love violence. Some people love food. Some people love drugs. What we give up now, what we love now that we decide to give up, whatever it is, if you decide to give up what you love now, it's so that you can have that love potentially in the future. Not the sin of it, but the enjoyment of it. So do you love sleep now? Give up what you love so that you can have sleep later. If, do you love to uh, go on vacations now? Do you love to take time off now? Well, give up what you love so that you can take vacations and take time off later. Give up what you love right now. It's a cause and effect. If you give up what you love right now, it affects your future, generally for the better. Many times we don't understand that what we give up now may extend our life and brighten our future. How many people would have been better off giving up on cigarettes? I was uh, not that you know, you've smoking cigarettes. I, I don't condemn you. God doesn't condemn you. Uh, we're not an anti <laughs> anti cigarette church. But I was reading. I was I was reading a. Uh, uh, well, we we were reading about John Wayne just yesterday. And we were spending a lot of time and uh, he went through three marriages and, and he had some real issues. And uh, we have a lot of John Waynes around our house. In fact, um, I had, I, the only reason Kathy didn't marry John Wayne is she didn't have his phone number. Um, I, so uh, she was stuck with me. So I had a, I had a, I had to get John Wayne movies and a lot of them are in black and white. And I don't know, we must have a thousand of them or something like that. It seems like that. So but we read about him now and again. We have books around. And one of the, one of the things that we were watching yesterday was his, his third wife said he would, or his, one of his daughters said, he would light a cigarette in the morning and that would be the last time he lit a match. And he just went from cigarette to cigarette all day. He had an ashtray in the center of his bed, custom built. And he died from all, he had cancer of the lungs, he had cancers of the pancreas, cancer of the stomach, he had all kinds of problems, probably particularly from smoking cigarettes. And people try to get him to give up on that. Here's the point. What we give up now that we love will, call, will brighten our future later on. Amen. Whatever you give up now, particularly things that are negative for you are negative in your age group. If you're a young person and you're not working, that's a very negative thing. Say, so, well, I don't have any skills. No one wants to hire me. How do you get opportunities to get your skills built by closing off the opportunities to get your skills built? My point being is this. You can get on the job training when you get a job. You have no skills, get a job. And that job will give you skills to move to another job. When I was young, I had... I don't know, I had probably 40 different jobs. I had jobs, everything from flipping hamburgers at McDonald's to chopping ice out in the parking lot of McDonald's. I, I knew how to work on cars. I knew how to race cars. I knew how to build cars for racing. I knew how to rebuild an engine. I then, I, I had to go for one of my employers. I had to go and learn how to detail cars. To this day, I use that gift to detail my own car. The same thing that they use to make a car look bright and shiny so you go and buy it and pay more money for it. I learned all kinds of things. Then uh, one of my jobs I got shoved into, I had, I had to do bill collecting, overseas bill collecting for a large military installation. And so I had to collect money from soldiers that weren't paying on their car loans. And so I got to do that. And then later on, when I started my own company, all these things came into effect. I had to make collection calls. I had to call my customers and say, you know, your bill is three months overdue. I really, I need to feed my babies. My point being is this, everything that you learn now builds upon itself and gives you a better future. Go to work, start something, do something. Amen. Amen. In order to gauge your future, you have to give up something that you love now. Right. So if you love God, that's going to affect your future and it's going to affect your future for the better. So what should you give up now to extend and brighten your future? What do you think? And I want conviction to come upon you right now. What is it that no one else knows about you that if you gave it up right now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you'd be doing way, way better. 
What is it that's getting in your way right now? For some people, it's anger. For some people, it's laziness. For some people, it's just having too much of a good time on Friday and spending all their money and coming home broke every single Friday. I've had many employees that came to work for me that that's what they thought that he can do. And I would pull them in. I say, you know, your wife called me last week and complained about your paycheck. So what are you doing with it on Friday? And then come to find out she didn't know what he was making. Spending it all. It wasn't my fault that the wife is complaining, but what if he went home and took your family out rather than going to the bar with your buddies? What would be the difference? Now you'd at least be spending it and your wife can see where the money is going to. Amen. Cause and effect. All these things cause and effect. It will brighten your future. Plus, it'll make your marriage better. How about, how about people that love to use their credit card but can't pay it off? How about people that love to use their credit card during the Christmas season and are paying on that same credit card 24 months later for Christmas two years ago? Does anyone even remember what you gave them that you put on that credit card? Well, it's only $1,500. Yeah, but if you can't pay it off in a month, don't spend it. Oh, but I just love the shop. I understand. I've been around people who love the shop. I happen to be one of them. One of the greatest things that has come out of this, these shutdowns is this. It broke my habit for going to the store just to walk around and, and come to the cash register with $78 worth of stuff I didn't think I needed before I walked in there. And I'm still practicing that new rule. I don't need to spend money. I got everything I need. I don't need another water bottle. I got three at home already. It's only a dollar, but it's a dollar that if you saved it, you can spend it later on in something else. It's the law of cause and effect. Whatever you love to do now that's getting in your way of something that you want to have later on, stop doing that negative thing. And it may not look negative. It's, it's more than likely no one will ever see it as being a sin. God won't see it as being a sin. Your accountant won't see it as being a sin. Your husband, your wife, your kids will say, well, you know, mom just likes to, dad just likes to, dad loves his bass boats. He's got to get a new one every year. Dad loves his pickup trucks. He's got to get a new one every year. Yeah, but they're living in an old house. Stop buying the cars and the bass boats and move uptown and get a better house. And then when that house is starting to get paid down, then go get your bass boat. Cause and effect. Then go get your new pickup truck every year. Cause and effect. And to love God will affect your future. To love your neighbor as yourself will affect your future. Amen. So what should you give up now in order to extend and brighten your future? For most younger people, when I say younger people, anyone under 50, most younger people, it means go to work, stay at work. In fact, let me show you this. Let's go over to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. All right. So God wants you to be confident. He doesn't want you to be all beaten up and down. And you know, I'm just a bug in the rug. I'm, God doesn't love me. I'm so miserable. I'm not a perfect person, you know. All right. First of all, everyone knows you're not a perfect person. All right. Secondarily, God knows you're not a perfect person, which is why he went through the effort to send Jesus, his only begotten son to the earth to die on the cross for your sins. Yeah. Right. I just love it when people come up to me over the years and go, well, you know, pastor, you're not perfect. Good golly. No kidding. <laughs> Anyone else here not perfect? We're all not perfect. <laughs> Let's, can we get over the false humility and saying we're, we're looking in the mirror going, well, I'm just not perfect. Really? Too many people are saying that about themselves and never getting on to what God wants them to do. They're making excuses for lazy behavior. Let's keep reading. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Everyone say endurance. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. If he shrinks back from doing what the calling on his life is, when I say his, I, that's, that's, that's a neuter term. That means men, women, children, anybody. 
But if you shrink back, my soul has no pleasure in him or takes no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back to destruction. Understand, he's not just talking about lack of salvation. He's talking about a different type of destruction, not doing the will of our Father in heaven here in the earth. But of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. And as we're going to see here this morning, these things are all connected to one another. Amen. Look at this now. Right? The question many people have and ask, particularly when times get a little bit tough, what is the meaning of life? I hear this question often, particularly when people are in sickness, uh, there's a loss in the family, uh, there's a loss financially, uh, they come and they get really private with God, they get really desperate with God. And it's understandable in, in many cases, but not all cases. There's some cases we're just so immature we don't realize what's, what's really going on. Sometimes when God takes you out of a job, he's closing the door so he can send you to a better job. We were just uh, watching a, a story, a real life story, where a man uh, was robbed of a, a sale of land back in the 1800s, and he was pushed off of his own land that he paid good money for, but he came to a better place and in another state, and when he got there, the first person he bumped into he said, would you like to have half of my land? I need someone farming it. And he got a much better piece of land for free, true story, than the one that he paid for. Sometimes we are pushed out of a a job so God can get us a better job. Sometimes we're pushed out of a negative situation so we, God can move us into a better situation. We don't see what God is doing. Right. Amen. So many people ask this question, particularly when they're under duress, what's the meaning of life? This is my answer to them. What's the meaning of life? Keep working. So, no, no, I need to know what the meaning of life is. Yeah, get up in the morning, shower, shave, smell good, go and do your job to the best of your ability. Amen. Keep working. In fact, there are signs out there that you can buy. They're popularized in, in these, you know, in these uh, stores that have signs that you can hang up in your wall. If you're sick, work. If you're happy, work. If you're tired, work. If you're low, work. If you're poor, work. If you're rich, work. If your bills are paid, work. If your bills aren't paid, work. If you're married, work. If you're not married, work. If you're divorced, work. If you're a kid, work. If you're a man, work. If you're a woman, work. And in the end, the whole thing comes down to is our responsibility in life is this. Under God, not under man's rules, but under God's rules, that we keep applying ourselves. Now watch this now. Persistence, I wrote this down because God gave me, gave me this. Persistence is not busyness. You never see people that are super busy. They're working all the time. They're doing it, but they're just keeping busy. They're really not productive. They're not moving their family ahead. They're not moving their kids ahead. They're just busy people. They, you can tell by how they're acting that they're just nervous Nellies. They're busy. But persistence is sticking to the things of great importance of God, family, and country. God Honoring him first, family, that means providing an income for your family, ruling your family, running your family, bringing your family to God, and then serving your country. That doesn't mean in the military, but just doing what's best for your country. What's doing best for your country is what's best for your society. What's best for your society is what's best for your neighborhood. What's best for your neighborhood is best for what happens in your house. And it goes in the reverse role. Do with the best what you can in your home, then you do in the neighborhood, then you do in society, than you do for your country. God wants us to be producers. He wants us to be persistent. Well, my marriage just isn't working out. Really, that's a reason for you to go out, drink at night, and then lose your job? That's dumb. That's dumb. You keep working at your job, and you keep working through things until things work themselves out. Keep working. It is a rule. It's a law of God that's immutable. God wants us to work. The Bible says this over in Proverbs, as a door turns on its hinges, so the sluggard turns in his bed. The sluggard says, I cannot go to work. There's a lion outside in the streets. Sluggards, people who will not work, who will not go to work, people who take too much time off. You ever hear of a song called uh, Too Much Time on My Hands? Popularized, or it was a lyric anyway, within, by a, a group that I grew up with that sticks. And, and uh, really, it's a ballad of Christianity, of how we're actually supposed to think as Christians. 
because the man that wrote it grew up a Christian in a good southern home. People have too much time on their hands. Look around. Too much time. I don't want to put anyone down for going to a casino, but why are people spending eight hours at a casino? Why don't you spend eight hours cleaning out your garage, cleaning up your kitchen, cleaning up your car? And then you'd still have money at the end of the day. To, if you need to go to the casino, you could do it in a clean car. People don't see the cause and effect of giving up what they love now so they can do it later on. Amen. Amen. Here's another secret. A body in motion tends to stay in motion. Well, that's not a secret. I just read you those laws from by Sir Isaac Newton. Right? A body, that's part number three of his laws. A body that is in motion tends to stay in motion, and a body at rest tends to stay at rest. Well, that's law number one. Activity, a businessman came to me one day. I was in his bar. I was drinking. This was a long time ago. It was 40 years ago. And he came up to me. He goes, Dave, you know what? Activity breeds activity. And I sat there, and I was mad at him for about an hour. Got up and left and decided never to come back. Not because of what I would, because I was mad at him, but because he told me a truth. Activity breeds activity. Inactivity breeds inactivity. Amazing where you can learn some valuable wisdom that'll stay with you for the rest of your life. So what is, what is one of the ways to stay active and be prosperous at being active, right? How about this? How about the housewife that takes a glass, moves it to here, and then moves it to here, and then moves it back to here. The dishwasher is over there. It still hasn't made it yet, but she's touched it four times. I have a law called touch it once, right? And I, I practice it. I think it all the time. I come to church. I think it. I have my Bible in my hand. Touch it once. Where does it go? Well, I got to preach today. Where does it go? Where does it go? Where does it go? My, my pulpit out here yet? If it is, here it goes. Touch it once. When I have garbage in my hand and I know I have to go out to the dumpster and I have to do something else, touch it once. I'm not going to pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down as if I'm kind of like eventually moving over to another part of my property. Pick it up, make the walk, get it done, finish it. Put it in the end zone. Do it. Touch it once. If it, have you ever actually, if you start to practice, touch it once, you'll have more stuff done by the end of the day. And you'll not use as much energy because you won't have picked it up four times. You know people that pick up things four times? I know. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. And it amazes me. And I go, have you ever heard of the a theory of touching it once? <laughs> I generally don't get any response. <laughs> just, just, like, just like what I got. I don't generally get any response. My kids know about it. And I see my kids practicing touch it once all the time. And as a result of it, they have more free time on their hands when they want to have free time on their hands. Because if you touch it once, it is freed up four times amount of time that you would have used under normal conditions. You have need of endurance. Keep working. A body that's in motion tends to stay in motion. A body at rest tends to stay at rest. You ever been uh, sitting around for a week, right? And you had, you know, a little cold, something going on in your home, you're sitting around. What's the first thing that, well, let me put it another way. Have you ever seen a locomotive? A locomotive that's cold, that's sitting on the tracks, it hasn't moved for a week. What do you got to go, go in there and do? If it's coal fired, you got to fill it up with coal, light a match. But you, then you have to heat it up and heat it up and you got to get the boiler going. If it's wood, you got to do the same thing. Take the wood, you got to do that. And then eventually you get enough steam where you can blow the whistle. And then you get enough steam where you can start to move ahead. A body that's at rest tends to stay at rest. What's the best thing to do? Well, we can follow the law, the immutable laws of, of six days of work and one of rest. If we're working six and resting on the seventh day, by the way, that's a law of God that you cannot violate. Well, pastor, I got to work on Sundays. I'm a cop. I'm a teacher. I, I have to work at the hospital. I, I, I'm, I have to do certain things. Then take another day off. Take another day off. Take 
24 hours off from changing your environment around you. You cannot violate this rule. If you violate the rule, I was reading about a famous preacher. I read about famous preachers all throughout the week. And most of them are, have gone on to one of the one, this one preacher that died in, I think it was 1925. He said on his deathbed, he was dying at age 72. He had accomplished much for the kingdom. He said and confessed, he said, I wish I'd taken more time off. He said, I don't think I'd be dying right now if I took more time off. Some people just work too much. They don't know how to stop working. And I know about that, that syndrome. It's a syndrome I have to deal with personally. It's part of my, maybe the way I was brought up, or maybe it's a hiccup in my personality, but I have to force myself to rest. Some of you need to slow down. For the majority of people, you need to speed up. You need to work six days. And working six days isn't going to work for four hours and coming home and seeing what's on with Oprah or, or Ellen or someone else. It's about coming home and producing at home. Do something at home. Clean out a closet. Do something when you get home. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Wouldn't you say that's right? Yes. <laughs> it's an inside joke. Praise God. Anyway, so <laughs> persistence is sticking to the great important things in your life. Family, God, society, health, well-being. Uh, there are uh, things that um, in cause and effect, I don't have very much time, but I want to tackle this one. Go with me over to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes 7. It's a subject matter that I could talk on for hours and hours and hours, and it's the subject matter of sexual foolishness. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 25 I directed my mind to know, to investigate and to seek wisdom and an explanation and to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. So he's saying that there's a cause and effect for folly and foolishness. All right. So and he was going to increase in wisdom to look at these things closely. He tackles in this next verse just one, although he's tackling a lot of them in Ecclesiastes. Verse 26, and I discovered more bitter than death. All right. So there's death and there's something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are chains, one who is pleasing to God will escape her, but the sinner will be captured by her. All right. Now, there is a lot more going on here than we really have time for. But think of this. Lack of good moral behavior produces all kinds of problems. How many men I, we've had women uh, that we, Kathy and I have ministered to that were just treacherous, treacherous women. And they had been treacherous to men in churches, of all places, to men in churches. And what did they do? They were married. In fact, the word there, adulteress, is really not what's in the original Hebrew. The word in the original Hebrew is actually two Hebrew words, and it's isha, and it's Male owned. So the term for male ownership and Isha. Isha means wife. Male ownership means a married wife. And so it shows that she is owned by another man. We see it in the English adulteress and we miss we miss the depth of what's being happening here. All right. So. The woman whose heart is snares and chains. Now watch this now. Lack of good moral behavior produces all kinds of problems. So uh, Kathy and I have seen this up close uh, in business. We've seen many men succumb to women in their industry, uh, women that they come into contact to, and then it reverses as well. We've seen many women uh, succumb to men in their industry and men in their organization and men working in their office. It works both ways. It says in Proverbs uh, 626, on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread and the adulteress or the married woman hunts for the precious life. Right. So if, if someone that goes to harlots, he can lose all, he can lose his week's paycheck. I've investigated this. This needs to be talked about on account of a harlot, a man can spend his entire week's wages and he's reduced to a loaf of bread because that's all he's got at the end of the week to show and bring home to his wife. And on the, in the same thought, the adulteress hunts for the precious life. She doesn't just want the money. She wants, she wants the man. 
So she will do whatever she can to destroy that person. You know what that means? For those of you who've seen enough love stories and watched the, the something channel, you know what the outcomes of all these things are. Cause and effect. More than likely, it's financial problems. It's painful separation. It's separation permanently from your children. It is lifetime embarrassment if it's not fixed. No extramarital contact is without consequences. None. Zero. It may look like it for a period of time, but there is no extramarital contact that is without consequences. Everything, particularly with sex, has a price. Here, we're right, reading two different things. We're reading chains. Get a phone call. I need my car fixed. You get a phone call. I need my lawn mowed. You get a phone call. And before you know it, you're mowing someone else's grass just to stay off someone's radar. Exposure. I've seen this firsthand. It goes on all the time. Oh, I need to pay my credit card. I need three grand this month. I, I had my dog, uh, I took my dog in and, 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 and just to keep him alive for one more month. And I need three grand to pay for my dog. Love is an absolute truth. To properly love and to properly love yourself. If you love yourself, you'll protect your future by your actions now. You won't fall for the things. If you really love yourself, and I think self-love has been underrated because the Bible talks about self-love in its proper context. Self-love will keep you from all kinds of sin and foolishness. Here he's saying to know the evil of folly and the foolishness of madness. If we go to over to, to Proverbs chapter 6 and Proverbs chapter 7, almost in its entirety, talks about the madness of adultery. It will wreck you. Now that means not just adultery, but any sexual sin. So it does not eliminate homosexuals, fornication, or lesbians, by the way, or transvestites and any other, other group that we could possibly talk about in today's society. It involves all sexual consequences. Love is an absolute truth. Love yourself properly. If you love yourself properly, you'll go, I really want a future. Do I want to do this? Remember David and Bathsheba? He didn't love himself enough. He looks down, sees a beautiful woman naked in a bath. She shouldn't have been doing that. She was as much responsible. He goes, bring her up. Gets her pregnant kills her husband, then God says this, cause and effect, David, because there's been so much bloodshed on your hands, the sword will never leave your house. Absalom dies. One of his daughters is raped. His other, his other sons uh, don't like him, don't love him. He's pushed out of his own office, out of his own kingdom for a period of time by his son. His own generals don't listen to him. He loses all respect of everybody. Why? For one night with somebody? And maybe not even a night. It's a little foolishness, but someone who loves themselves doesn't go down that road. There is, I'm telling you church, there is a cause and effect. Sex is not free. There's always a price. And if any man is married here, he knows what I'm talking about. You have to behave. First thing you gotta do is endure. The second thing is you gotta do is you gotta behave. God is unchanging, so his universal laws are moral absolutes and they do not change. God said, I do not change, therefore you are not destroyed, O Israel. God does not change. Society's changed, but God does not change. Moral absolutes are just what they sound like. They are absolute you, they are inequivocally cannot be violated without you taking something and happening to you. Let's go over to uh, Luke chapter 19, Luke 19, verse 11. And while they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Of course, he's talking about himself. Right. But it's a parable. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minus and said to them, do business with this until I come or occupy, it says in the King James, until I come. 
But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Bad move. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your mine is made, ten mine is more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over ten cities. I want you to think about this. Come the millennial reign, we're going to be coming back in our glorified bodies. And if you have the heart to believe it today, man or woman, we're not going to be getting married in heaven. You can be over ten cities. Pick your city now. The second came saying, your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him also, you are to be over five cities. Another came saying, master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and you reap what you did not sow. Of course, he's, he's making up excuses. And he said to him, by your own words, I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I'm an exacting man taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, master, he has 10 minas already. This seems a little unfair. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. In other words, if you go as far as you can, God will bring you to the next level. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. This is all a parable of what's going to be happening at the white throne judgment. These are things that are going to be happening shortly. So there are some things in life that cannot be made up. You cannot get back time. Time is once. It happens once. The clock is ticking into your future. You cannot go back and retrain your two-year-old when he's seven years old or 16 years old. Train up a child in the way that he should go. The effects of what you do now will go way into the future and may affect not only your eternity, but may affect the eternity of your children or, or people after you. What you do now may affect your eternity. You say, well, I'm going to make it into heaven. Yeah, but since you could have brought more people with you, God is going to put you on the bottom rung. You're not going to be a bright shining star. You're going to be some distant planet with a little bit of light bouncing off of it. You'll be Pluto. All right. Every action or inaction has an effect. Every action or inaction has an effect. When you're not acting, that's action. People say, well, I'm not going to do anything wrong. I'm not going to do anything. That's exactly what Jesus just complained about. Those who think that you're not doing anything are really doing something. You're choosing to do nothing. Amen. You're choosing not to work, not to rest, not to raise a family, not to get married. You're choosing. You're making choices. What does Jesus say? It's clear. Let me put it into, into crystal clear form, what he says here in many other places. Wasted time and ability is sin. Amen. Wasted time and ability is sin. Let me say it again. Wasted time and ability is sin. You see, some of these young people, they come from wealthy families, they travel all over the globe, uh, they join the Peace Corps, they join all these other things, they come back five years later, they have a great education, and they're still not ready to work. They show up at their first job with a backpack on, and it's an executive job. They have no clue. They've been wasting their time. God's not against travel. He's not against young people seeing the world. But when you put things out of order, you push back your future. If you love to do something now, give up what you love so that you can do it later on with rest and peace and with things going on. You ever hear of the term triple threat? First, I first remember being used in, in acting. You had to be a triple threat. You had to be able to act, sing, and dance. And it's still, when we watch all these old black and white movies, it's just absolutely fascinating to see someone that you saw acting all of a sudden get a microphone and they have an operatic voice and it just, you, you, know, you saw 10 movies with them. You never saw them even try to carry a note, a tune. And now you hear that they could have been a, a maestro of some kind. 
That could have been the, one of the greatest things out there, singing or dancing or ballerina, triple threat. What God wants every human being to do is be a triple threat. I've seen it in business all the time. You develop one income stream, then another, then it's somehow if you just keep working, you keep on developing more income streams. Triple threat. By the time you're 50 or 60, you'll be a triple threat. You've got income stream here and income stream there. If society breaks down a little bit, Ecclesiastes tells us, put your money into seven, even into eight, for you know not what misfortune may come upon the earth. Put your money into seven, even into eight, for you know not what misfortune may come upon the earth. You can't put your money into seven and eight if you haven't put your money in one yet or two. And the people that only get to one and only stay at one are people that really are not using their time wisely. It's not about working all the time. It's about working and resting, working and resting. God, family, work. That proper order. These are absolute standards. You can't violate them. Again, people in motion tend to stay in motion. If you may have someone that works six days, takes a day off, come day eight again, they're back up and they're ready to go to work. People in motion tend to stay in motion. People at rest tend to stay at rest. Which is why you can look at people and you know exactly, looking at them, I'm not being critical, understand, but we do judge things around us whether we realize it or not. You can look at someone and say, that person's been at rest for a long time. And people have too much time on their hands, right? We can get a government dole. I've never seen, I've never seen so many lazy people in my life. So, well, pastor, I, I really need, I really need this, this handout. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you have a genuine problem wrong with you, but the majority of people that I have talked to do not, and they should go to work. I just met a man who, who lost a limb. He went back to work, and he's producing more now than he did when he had all of his appendages. And he's watching probably right now. Go to work. If you're sick, go to work. If you're tired, go to work. If you're old, go to work. If you're young, go to work. Cause and effect. People in motion tend to stay in motion. People at rest tend to stay at rest. I'm going to close it here um, in John 14. John 14. Verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. You want to hear God talk to you? Go to work. Want to hear God talk to you? Put everything in order in your life. Put it in order. Right? So what do we have? We have endure, behave, touch it once. And really what we see in all this is set absolute standards for yourself. A standard that you will not break. What are the absolute standards? The Ten Commandments. To love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then your neighbor as yourself. That's an absolute standard. The Ten Commandments are an absolute standard. It's not old-fashioned. It's an absolute standard. Set absolute standards that you will not violate. And believe that there is a future. And by not doing the things that you love to do now you'll get a reward later on for your good behavior. Do the things that you really love now, even those destructive things, and there's a reward for bad behavior. Set boundaries for yourself. Sacrifice good now. Sacrifice the good you could have now so you can have good later on. Amen? Kathy, would you like to join me up here? Let's all stand to our feet here today. Well, if you've... Uh, Enjoyed this message here today. I'm glad it changed you. For those of you that are here and for those that are watching on television and watching live, we're glad that you're out there. One of the absolute absolutes that you have to decide and recognize is that God, there is one God and only one God. Amen. There's not a bunch of gods. There's not different names for the same God. There is one God in heaven and one Son and one Holy Spirit. And if you've never made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior before, that's an absolute. And if you'd like to do that right now, we're going to help you do that at home. If you need to, go ahead and stand to your feet. 
and repeat these words out loud with me in our congregation as you do at home. Say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus come into my heart right now, into my heart right now and make me a new person, a new, person, a new, creation. A new creation. I don't want to be, I don't want to be that old person anymore. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me so that I don't have to die for all the things that I've done wrong. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. If you just made that decision for Jesus Christ, I want to hear from you. Write to the address that's shown on your screen at David Gonzalez Ministries, P.O. Box 847, Lake Delton, Wisconsin, 53940, or email me at pastor at Mountain Faith, and I want to send this free little booklet out to you is the Bible for real? It's free of charge to anyone who wants it, whether you gave your heart to Jesus Christ just now or you've just been watching us for a period of time. I want to put one copy into your hands. Our partners and our friends have made that available and have requested that we do that. Amen. Praise God. We want to put it into your hands. Also, if you're watching us on television right now, you can watch us a couple hours later on live. You can go to our website, mountainfaith.org. You can watch us on YouTube. You can watch us on Facebook. You can watch us on our website. If you don't have any of those other opportunities or on Roku. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, become a, a subscriber to our YouTube channel. Not only help us push our numbers up as we're using YouTube more, but you'll get notifications from us when we put up our brand new videos like this one today and we convert it into HD format with scripture overlays and all kinds of other things that we do to it. So, uh, this is Pastor Dave and Kathy Gonzalez saying, Press into God. And he'll press into you. And we'll see you again here next Sunday at, at the mountain. mountain.